All right, it is 9.05. Uh, we are gonna get going. I know people are still going to be trickling in as we get going, uh, but I am one, really overwhelmed uh, by how many people are here in this space. I wanna shout out, um, and I don't know if she's quite in the room yet, uh, but Ella, uh, my assistant who's uh, helped invite so many of you. Um, I had to buy the big Zoom room today. <laughs> so I'm uh, very excited to have over a hundred of you here in this space. Um, um, you should be here for um, a webinar for uh, restorative justice in the workplace, thinking about going beyond diversity and inclusion. My name is David Ryan Barcega Castro Harris. Um, I'll share a little bit more about myself in a few moments, but I uh, just want to go over a couple things really quickly. Um, here we go. One, um, we will be sending out um, the slides for this um, after you fill out the reflection form uh, on uh, that I'm going to be sharing with you in just a few moments. Um, please feel free to use the chat box to introduce yourselves uh, as you're all continuing to do. Um, ask questions. We're going to do our best to uh, catch up with those. Um, and the recording for this will be shared. Um, feel free to um, share that with people uh, who are also, uh, you would also want to invite into this work. Um, a couple of group agreements that I want to put out here in this space. One is to expect unfinished business. Uh, we're going to be together for just about an hour. Uh, we're not solving racism today. We're not learning everything there is to learn about restorative justice. I hope you're going to have more questions than you do um, right now. So um, expect unfinished business. Um, to participate as much as possible uh, while taking care of your needs. I imagine some of you are watching this at your desks while you're doing some other work, um, or maybe you're on your lunch break. There's going to be a moment where we go into breakout rooms and uh, having people engage. And so uh, we love uh, as much participation as possible, also participation in the chat, but uh, we also understand that you've got other things going on at this time, uh, but participate as much as possible while you're here. And three, while we're here, uh, we're gonna be introducing some ideas that you might not have uh, learned before or have questions about. Um, and as you're talking to other people, you might be hearing some perspectives that are unfamiliar to you. So uh, the invitation is to lead with curiosity. Ooh, all right. Um, so with that being said, uh, welcome. My name is David Ryan Barcega Castro Harris, and that is all five names for all of my ancestors. Uh, my father's name is also David. Uh, Ryan is a combination of the letters from my maternal grandparents, Ruth and Yolando. Um, so that's how Filipinos do names sometimes. Farsega is my mom's family name. Castro is the name from my wife's family who came here from El Salvador um, in the late 90s. Sorry, in the early 90s, um, my mom's family came here from the Philippines in the late 70s. And Harris is the name given to my family after um, our people were enslaved, right, and brought here from West Africa before any of us can, rem can remember. And I introduced myself with all five names because I think that, in a lot of ways, talks about why I do this work, right? It's justice for ancestors and building a better world for people who are coming in the future. So thank you so much for being here. Restorative justice is something that I've dedicated, um, you know, the last six or seven years of my life to. I've done this in multiple settings uh, from schools to community organizations, uh, faith communities, um, some workplaces, right? Um, with some, <laughs> some political organizations as well, and that's had mixed results. Uh, but I'm really excited that y'all are uh, here to learn and learn about the intersection of uh, restorative justice in this work uh, and how it applies to your workplace and how it helps us go beyond conversations of just diversity and inclusion. I wanna acknowledge, oh, so restore, uh, Amplify RJ, the organization that I run, um, our mission is to teach restorative justice philosophy practices and values through a lens of abolition, anti-racism, and decolonization. And those words are big and scary to some people. Um, and 
I, for me, I have to be upfront about using these words and this is the perspective that I come from. That's the invitation for curiosity, right? When I'm talking about abolition, it's about building a world without the need for policing and prisons, right? It's about, as, it's, as much as it's about dismantling those systems, it's about building the alternatives. It's building the world that we want to see. It's about building institutions and systems that are giving life instead of creating death. Um, Anti-racism is a little bit more self-explanatory, naming, identifying, dismantling systems of oppression based on the inferior, inferiority and superiority between races, right? We know race is made up. And then decolonization, right? We started with acknowledging the land that we're on, right? Um, I am in the greater Los Angeles area, the land of the Quiche and the Tongva, right? Who have been twice colonized, right? First by the Spanish and then by the uh, United States after the Spanish American War. And while the Quiche and Tongva people are still here, um, the sovereignty isn't there. And so as we think about the project of restorative justice, racial justice, decolonization, all of this work is to repair harm because of genocide, enslavement, land theft, broken treaties, and now forced assimilation, which you know some might argue that's what diversity and inclusion is asking people to do, but we'll get to that in a second. Um, and the vision for all of this work is creating a world full of communities of care where people have the resources and knowledge to be able to practice being in right relationship uh, and good relatives to all. So, uh, we do this through a couple of uh, venues. One, uh, creating and sharing content. Most of what I do is on Instagram, but I'm starting to play in LinkedIn world where most of you came to this. Um, interactive learning experiences, which is this and some of the deeper things that we do and uh, developing communities of practice where people can support each other. So with that, um, today is May 26. And, you know, May 26 is a day of May 25, which was yesterday, uh, it was a day where we remember that uh, George Floyd was murdered. Um, but we also know that George Floyd's death um, and Breonna Taylor's death and Dante Wright's death and the death of murdered and missing indigenous women and all these other um, horrible, horrible things that happen because of systems of oppression, right? They're not exactly the reasons that any of us are doing this work, right? Um, systems of oppression have existed on this continent for one could argue 600 years. And so this is so much ancestral work. And so I just wanna take a moment to ground us for a moment in, you know, what is your why? Why are you here in this space? What brings you here? Um, I'm just gonna take a couple moments to let you reflect on that. And if you want to, you can share those in the chat. What brings you to this space? Um, but it's important to remember why, right? This is not a performative thing that we're doing. This isn't something we're doing that's just in response to the way that, uh, you know, the world has been in the last calendar year. The racial, um, the reawakened racial reckoning um, has happened for sure, but that's not the only reason why we're doing this work. I'm gonna take 30 more seconds to just sit in the why you're here in the space. And if you want to, you can share it in the chat. We've got school leaders recognizing that retributive paradigms fail to meet the needs of everyone, especially marginalized communities. We have people wanting to learn ways to get white Americans to not feel <laughs> guilty um, and to be able to listen to stories of black folks people living on the strength of their ancestors, who things are moving fast uh, and building for people who are coming after. Um, America should be fair, taking responsibility for what's around me. Just learning about restorative justice and broadening perspectives. Yeah, better tools for accountability and healing, healing yourself and community and spaces. Yes, yes. Thank you all so much for sharing. And you can continue to share those in the chat. Um, um, a year ago, George Floyd was murdered. Um, and since then, people have done all sorts of things, right? Um, been in the streets, um, holding visuals. And maybe some of you have posted black squares on Instagram, right? Maybe you have gone to any number of diversity and inclusion trainings. 
Maybe you've gotten into Ibram X. Kendi, Robin D'Angelo, Leila Saad, Ichioma Aluo, um, any number of people who are pushing folks to think about uh, what it means to be anti-racist and what it means to do justice work. Um, and, you know, we're still in this place where things aren't just, uh, you know, statistics last year um, showed that over $8 billion was spent on diversity training every year. Um, and I'm sure that number was blown out of the water. Um, if you were to take the calendar from June of last year to right now, um, but I'm looking for the chat. Why aren't things better? I have ideas, but what are yours? Power hoarding, for sure. <laughs> Product over process. Uh, performative box checking. <laughs> Cover your ass approaches. Yep, not healing. Lack of commitment. Um, oh man, now it's going fast. Uh, reactive and performative. Uh, lack of act beyond education. It's just window dressing performative. Uh, white dominant structure is very hard to change. Lack of responsibility and y'all can see capitalism. Yes, absolutely. Um, keeping up appearances. Oh man. There are, there are so many things flying by in the chat. White fragility, right? Lack of exposure to culture. People's memories are short. Perfectionism, not wanting to take responsibility for systemic change. The nonprofit industrial complex. Uh, ooh, transformation versus a transaction. Um, you know, we have good intentions, but the bare minimum is what's done. People don't know where to start. Yeah, so many different things. Um, I like to think about the words diversity and inclusion, um, and I don't really like them. <laughs> uh, when I think about those words, I think about diversity being people who embody uh, marginalized identities uh, being represented, um, right? How do we bring people from marginalized communities into the space where uh, we're talking about restorative justice in the workplace, so let's just say where we're working. Um, if you think about the origins of the word diversity, and I just learned this about a month ago, uh, one of the first uh, recorded uses of the or the, the root word of uh, diversity, diversas in Latin, right, was used in a papal bull, um, shout out to the Catholics in the room, um, where the Pope was um, giving this decree that it was okay for these uh, kingdoms, right, to go into Africa to exploit resources, diversifying the wealth and resources and the labor and the knowledge of people from, you know, marginalized communities, diverse communities for the benefit of the people who already had power, right? Uh, we're not just thinking about bringing people in and extracting wealth, knowledge, and power. There's a business case to be made for diversity, and many of us can say that forwards and backwards. Um, and I think that is helpful, but that's not getting us to uh, equity and justice. When we think about inclusion, um, in the most generous terms, I think about we're talking about uh, bringing people who embody those marginalized identities and providing them a sense of welcome and belonging. And I think that is generally positive. That might be harm reductive. But we also have to think about the structures or the systems or the places that we're bringing them into. Are those places where they are being able to be celebrated for um, all of their identities, right? Um, or are they having to be forced into assimilation? Many of you, as you registered for this space, um, uh, answered a poll. Not everyone did. And so I'm going to put it up now um, because I believe diversity and inclusion won't save us from a culture rooted in white supremacy. Um, and when we're talking about diversity and inclusion, not many people explicitly name that, right? And so, oh man, where's the poll? There it is. Um, just looking to hear from the folks who are in the room. We've got about 150 of us. So I'm gonna hold the poll open for a little bit. If you were to bring up dismantling white supremacy culture at work, how would people react? Uh, it's definitely a mix depending on your workplace, right? Choose the one that is most relevant.
Oh yeah, and sure, there are differences between uh, manager reactions and employees for sure. Is it even common language to have this discussion? Ooh, we'll talk about that in a second. So, <laughs> you know, this is this is really interesting. Uh, we have it is it is pretty damn even. Um, we have people who are fully engaging, right? Having the conversation in hushed tones, uh, giving confused looks like, what? White supremacy? I'm not part of the KKK, right? I didn't attend the cross burning. I wasn't storming the Capitol, right? Um, and we have some people who are running away or shutting it down. Um, in the chat, like people are acknowledging that there are differences between uh, people who hold power and people who don't, um, and that's very real. Um, I'm also really encouraged that there are people who are fully engaging or at least uh, being open to having the conversation. Um, to Andrea's point, um, and I hope I pronounced your name correctly. Um, we don't always have common language to talk about white supremacy. And, you know, Tema Oken is someone whose work I've built a lot of what we do with Amplify RJ uh, around where she identifies white supremacy culture, right? She doesn't define it as marching with the Klan or, um, you know, burning crosses or using racial slurs. Uh, she talks about these characteristics of white supremacy where whiteness is normalized. Um, the slide is a little bit old and by old, <laughs> I mean, Tema released an update to her website this week. And so I'm dropping that link in the chat um, where she's kind of rearranged some of these things and this is very resource rich. So feel free to explore that website when you get a chance. But when we think about white supremacy culture, we're thinking about the ways that whiteness is upheld as the normal, as the norm and protecting people, right? Uh, just one right or one white, way of being, right? We can also think about whiteness as cisness, um, hetero, uh, Protestant work ethic -y, right? Um, this objectivity, right? Um, either or or binary thinking, worship of the written word being like, if it's not in the policy book, if it's not in the handbook, we're not about this. Um, it's about perfectionism, having a certain expectation of things and if things aren't that, um, not having space for grace and for people to learn and grow. It's product it over people. I saw someone say that in the chat, quantity over quality, uh, getting things done with senses of urgency and immediacy, not caring for uh, the learning process and the fullness of who people are. Uh, people in the chat also already mentioned like power hoarding and individualism and um, thinking that people in power are the people who are the best to make decisions. <laughs> Right. Um, it's about fear of open conflict, not wanting to challenge power or have power challenge, right? Being comfortable in those positions. It is defensiveness. It is so many of these things. Yes, it's it's so there, there's so much tied up in this. And so when we think about white supremacy culture, um, I had a subtle plug or shameless plug. Uh, I had a conversation with Tema Oken on my podcast, uh, This Restorative Justice Life at the beginning of this year. And we talked about how, you know, white supremacy culture, really its function is to separate people, disconnect people. Um, we're gonna talk about restorative justice in a second, but for me, it's all about interconnection. And so when we think about why DEI doesn't work, I think about um, including people from diverse backgrounds into structures uh, that really aren't built for relationships rooted in equity and trust. Um, and this work is about relationships. Policies are important. I don't want to discount that, but policies are only as good as the people who are upholding them, right? Um, and we know that policies don't get applied equally across the board. And so when we think about the relationships that people have, how do we move through these things? I think restorative justice offers us a way to move forward um, in a much more equitable and trust and just uh, trusting and just way um, to get people's needs met um, as much as possible. Yes. So when I think about restorative justice, I think about it as a philosophy instead of practices rooted in indigenous teachings that emphasize their interconnection by repairing relationships while harm occurs, while also proactively building and maintaining relationships to prevent 
future harm. Now you might have heard about restorative justice in a few different contexts, um, sometimes in the criminal legal system, sometimes in schools. Um, but I really think about you know, where people who popularize restorative justice learned these things. It was from indigenous folks. Someone like Howard Zur, who I'm gonna share his words in a minute, um, learned about this model of victim offender conferencing from the Maori people of New Zealand, right? And when they have this idea of wakapapa, like shared genealogy at the center of their, uh, you know, their value system, we are thinking about how we're all connected, right? And so of course, when we're connected, we realize that we can't cancel or alienate or kick people out of our community, we have to repair. It's so much easier to do that when we have relationships rooted in equity and trust. And so that's that proactive relationship building. When I think about my roots, right? I think about uh, Filipino words for this idea, right? Kapwa is this idea of shared brotherhood um, in Tagalog, but in a pre-colonial language of the Philippines, Babayan, it's this shared uh, connection between all beings, all living beings. Uh, from my African roots, Ubuntu, right? I am because we are, or a person is a person through another person. Uh, from Mayan roots, we're thinking about in la quech, a la quen, I am another you, you are another me. From uh, Lakota perspectives, right? We think about metakuyasen, we are all relatives. These words exist across all of our cultures. Some of us are um, more in touch with them or closer to them than others, but these roots exist, right? We all lived together in tribes of 150 or less. And so when you do that, you are forced to want to repair harm because when you're alienating someone or kicking someone out, right? That probably means they're gonna die. <laughs> Um, and that means that you um, are losing a really valuable member of your community who plays an integral role. So when I think about restorative justice, it is both that repair as well as that proactive building. Howard Zur, uh, who some would call the grandfather of restorative justice, I know he would reject that label, but he uh, acknowledged that you know lots of people have thought a lot of different ways about restorative justice over the years. Um, but he defines restorative justice as process to involve to the extent possible those who have a stake in a specific offense and to collectively identify and address harms, needs, and obligations in order to heal and put things as right as possible. Um, and when, uh, and, and he wasn't the first person to talk about this, right? Restorative justice, the phrase has been used since the 1800s, um, it, but it's been primarily about repairing harm. Um, and I wanna make the argument that it is so much more than that. Uh, the model that we use uh, with Amplify RJ is this with a, with a tree. Instead of thinking just about how do we get to accountability, right? Uh, and I define accountability as you know acknowledging harm, changing behavior and repairing harm to the extent possible. Uh, healing relationships and healthy community. Those are like the fruit and the leaves of those of that tree, right? And everybody wants to get to the, I, I love the tree metaphor because, you know, the fruit is what feeds other people and communities. Uh, the leaves are what feed you yourself as the tree, right? It's both for yourself and others. Um, fruit comes, fruit and leaves come from branches. And when we think about restorative justice processes where we're asking questions about what happened, who was impacted and how, and how can we make things right? Instead of taking a punitive approach where we're asking what rule is broken, who did it, and how can we punish them? Um, that's gonna get us to humanize folks. It's not gonna get us to define people as the terrible thing that they've done. We're gonna look at people as holistic. Um, and those processes will help us to get to you know those fruits. But much like the branches of the tree need to be supported by um, a strong trunk and roots in order to produce fruit, restorative justice processes need to be supported by proactive restorative practice and rooted in restorative mindsets and values. So when we think about the trunk of the RJ tree, right, we think about the ways that we take care of ourselves, right, as spiritual, mental, physical, emotional human beings. And how are we creating an environment for others to be able to do the same in the communities and for the purposes of our time together, workplaces that we're a part of, right? How are we prioritizing people um, over, over 
productivity, profit, right? How are we making sure that people are celebrated for the fullness of who they are, right? How are we examining the intersectional impacts of our identities, right? Um, it's not just about race, it's about our gender, ability and disability. It is about um, socioeconomic status, it's about education. There's so many intersections of identity that impact the way that you show up in your position in your workplace impacts the way that your organization uh, interacts with people uh, in the community that you're serving, right? Um, we think about, uh, you know, social and emotional learning, thinking about enhancing our own capacity to identify, name, and enhance um, our, sorry, our own capacity to identify our own emotions and hold that space for others, right? It's really hard to have these conversations uh, around healing when you're not able to tap into those things. How do we recognize that trauma is not just this terrible thing that happens, but it is a behavior pattern that is adapted in response to those stressors, right? Um, there's a quote, trauma can often look like personality if you're not looking in the, in the right places, right? People have experienced lots of harm over the years and have adapted behaviors to deal with those things. And so how have we been socialized to navigate those things? If you're not able to recognize those things in yourself and recognize those things in others, you're going to be making assumptions about people that are probably not uh, accurate to, to who they are. When I think about uh, communication, right? It's not just the words that we say, it's how we say them, it's how we listen. Uh, are we building communicate? Are we building connection with people or are we alienating? Are we gaslighting? Um, are we dismissing people's perspectives? Um, and then, you know, talking circles are a way to make sure that we are um, listening to understand and they're a practice rooted in um, indigenous ways of being uh, that can be super helpful. And you can do all of these processes uh, in, in that way. Um, it's really hard to adapt these processes, both responsive restorative processes and proactive things. If you don't have fundamental assumptions that humans at their core are good, wise, and powerful, that we're all interconnected, um, that we all want to be in right relationship with each other at our core. And I know that there are barriers to that, uh, but like if these are the assumptions that you're making about humans, that's, uh, if, if these aren't the assumptions you're making about humans, it's gonna be really hard for you to do this work in a good way. We have to acknowledge that people are all gifted in the ways that, um, in, in unique ways um, and we're all needed for what we bring. It doesn't look like just one way of holding knowledge. Um, that we're all spiritual, mental, physical, emotional, right? We need to be appreciated for all of those things in our workplaces and in all the communities that we participate in. Um, it looks like upholding values of interconnection, equity, and again, not just racial equity. Um, we can talk about all the intersections of what that looks like. Um, it allows people to have choices, right? Autonomy, self-determination. It looks like being able to hold multiple perspectives at a time. And so, you know, restorative justice is not just like, how do we make the black people in our organization feel welcome, right? It's about how do we make, and or like, how do we market to the queer community, right? It's about how do we make sure that the environment that we're inviting people into is a place where people um, are really celebrated for all of who they are and making space for them to be that way and thrive, right? And I understand that organizations have missions, they have goals, they have products that they want to produce. Um, and organizations are run by people. You know, the machines are coming, but right now organizations are run by people. And so how do we make sure that these environments are places where people can really truly thrive? Um, so that leads us to our first discussion. How many people do we have in this space? We have 151 people. And so the invitation, yeah, we'll do groups of three or four um, to discuss, mm -hmm. right? Learning about these definitions and distinctions, what do you find challenging about shifting from diversity and inclusion to restorative justice? I'm gonna drop this question in the chat for everybody. There's going to be the 30 second countdown to, to bring you out. Um, and at the end, remember, we said expect unfinished business. Um, you will very rudely be ripped out <laughs> um, at the end of that countdown. So you are warned. Um, here we go. Yes, that was the fastest seven minutes. <laughs> um, 
we've got a little bit more time together. So there are a couple of more things I want to rip through. Um, we're going to save, I want to save some time for questions at the end and let you know about all the ways that we can continue to stay connected and, and do this work. Um, I want us to think about a time when you witnessed or experienced harm in the workplace. Um, all of these things have happened to me, <laughs> right? Um, first, just share in the chat, the one sentence version of this story, right? Where you experienced harm or witnessed harm in the workplace. Being misgendered. Wow. Yes, there are too many to share, Shanice. And I can't keep up with reading all of these, but um, there's so much. I wanna transition us from sharing the stories in the chat to sharing the feelings that we felt in the moment. Invisible, hurt, minimized, dismissed, unheard, violated, appalled, sad, shocked, dismayed, uh, cornered, exploited, gaslit, assaulted, anger, confused, upset, crying, disrespected, pressured, flabbergasted, dismissed, speechless, heartbroken, overwhelmed. What did you need in those situations? The listening, support, being heard, choices, support, action, a listening ear, someone to speak up, protection, defense, respect, ability to shake the person, connection, love, being asked rather than assumptions being made. If we were in person, I'd be trying to furiously scribble these down on a whiteboard, but I've taken some of the things that many people have said in experiences before you, feelings when we're harmed, and needs when we're harmed. Many of the things that you've shared. Some in maybe more specific ways. <laughs> um, we're gonna flip that. And the invitation is to think about a time when you caused harm at the workplace. You can share that in the chat, the one minute version of the story. Misuse of gender pronouns, right? Staying silent uh, when, black, when a black woman was being gaslit. Yeah, inappropriate jokes, not speaking up, not knowing when to speak up. taking up too much space. Unsolicited advice, right? Microaggressions. Thank you for being reflective. I want to invite us to shift towards sharing the feelings that we felt in those moments or the moments right after. Ignorant. Mm -hmm hypocritical, embarrassed, ashamed, sorry, anxious, embarrassed, defensive, powerless, disappointed. What did we need in those moments? Grace, space, mirrors <laughs> to swallow us up, connection to be checked, to apologize, education, grace, a coach, guilt. Oh, well, we, we needed <laughs> uh, reflection. We felt guilt, patience. Many of the feelings, many of the needs. When you put the list of feelings and needs when we're harmed and when we cause harm next to each other, they're not identical. But they're really, really similar. Of course, not all of these show up in every instance and the feelings and needs manifest differently. All right, hurt people, hurt people, right? People who are 
causing harm are often trying to get their needs met. Punitive approaches to harm don't meet most of these needs. You can make an argument for like the harm stopping in a moment or maybe some kind of apology, maybe time and space. Right. But what prevents us from meeting these needs? <laughs> Characteristics of white supremacy culture, right? Specifically, this fear of open conflict, uh, the right to comfort, defensiveness, this uh, power hoarding. And so when we think about these things that show up on uh, the restorative justice tree, right? They are, in fact, antidotes to white supremacy culture. And so instead of just thinking about how do we like diversify and include our way to, to justice and healing and equity, um, it's about embracing restorative justice as, as a way of being, right? Not just as a practice for repairing harm, but, but a way of being. And we're drawing close to the time that we're closing. But um, when we think about implementing restorative justice, it's not something that we force people into. If one of our values is autonomy um, and choice and self-determination, it's an invitation. It's providing the space. It's being that model, doing the work ourselves, um, and then thinking about institutional structural um, change, right? Involving all stakeholders, providing support, training resources, time for learning. And when I say learning, that's both learning and unlearning. That's messing up in the midst of practice um, and trying again, holding space for people to continue to learn and grow. And again, policy is important, but only as good as the people who are upholding it. So how are we equipping the people to make these changes? And so the impact of all of this, right, for individuals, it's really living from that good, wise, powerful core of yourself, right? Um, addressing the internalized white supremacy culture that you uphold, right? We all do it. Racism um, is something that is systemic. We are all participating in that. And how are we actively dismantling those things? How are we building our capacity to navigate conflict and harm, um, including racialized harm? Um, and then teams in workplaces, right? How are we building proactively strong relationships rooted in equity and trust? How are we identifying and repairing uh, past and future harm? How are we collaborating to share responsibility and set uh, clear expectations for the work moving forward? Um, this is what gets us to justice and equity. And so the calls to action, if you will. I know about a third of you in this space um, are educators. And educators are folks who I've worked with uh, extensively. So this is for you. Um, this summer, uh, we're doing a restorative justice intensive, uh, specifically for educators. Uh, it's going deep into all the things that we're talking about in that RJ tree, multiple cohorts, um, the dates, uh, and more information can be found um, online at, uh, let me get that link in the chat. Um, there we go. Um, and if you are in school leadership, um, We've got, actually, this is super last minute. And I, and if you selected education on your registration, I emailed you about this already, but um, we will be sharing um, a, a session tonight about in collaboration with uh, the Institute for Anti-Racist Education about what this looks like in schools. Um, so if you are not an educator, um, and even if you are an educator next week on uh, Wednesday, so that's a week from today. It's going to be in the evening uh, because it's going to be two hours, a much more fleshed out uh, intensive workshop where we are, I'm collaborating with uh, Victoria Alexander, uh, leading a workshop on the intersection of racial and restorative justice. Um, that can also be found at uh, ARJ, uh, tiny.cc slash ARJ events. Um, but if you want to bring this, organ this work to your place of work, organization. Uh, there are a couple ways to do that. One, just email me, amplifyrj at gmail.com. Uh, introduce yourself, tell me about your workplace, and let's see how we can build together. Um, by uh, registering, uh, you're already on the list. So, uh, Sarah, thank you. Um, and then uh, if you want to book time to talk about what this looks like, uh, amplifyrj.as.me is that space. So uh, I'll get that in the chat as well. Um, the podcast is 
this restorative justice life. Um, yeah, and it's on Apple, Spotify, iTunes. If you're on my LinkedIn, I post about the new episodes weekly. Um, and then finally, I wanna leave you with the words of Angela Davis. Um, you have to act if it were possible to radically transform the world. You've gotta do it all the time. So um, we do this work together. Uh, thank you for learning. Um, lots of opportunities to continue to learn again please feel free to reach out. Um, and I'm gonna leave this slide up and respond to any questions uh, that y'all have um, as long as people want to be here.